Welcome to West Houston Bible Church Thursday night Bible class. As uh, most everybody knows, Robbie is off running around Israel for the next two weeks. So in his absence, we have Ray Mondragon from uh, Schaefer Seminary, who's going to be with us the rest of the time, both Sundays and the weeknights. And so uh, he's an old friend of the church, been here many times. And so I welcome you and turn it over to you. Thank you. It's good to be home, I wanted to say. Should I say home? <laughs> well, tonight I'd like to start looking at Book of Genesis and obviously to try to deal with anything in the Book of Genesis. This is one of the most controversial books that uh, is in all of the Bible. And what makes it a little bit more difficult is uh, you need lots of time to deal with anything adequately. So I'm going to just try to cover just a few things in Genesis. Not an entire exposition. I won't do sentence by sentence. I might highlight a few things just because of the time and try to cover mainly issues related related to science. Tonight I'm going to simply do a little bit of an introduction and try to get us into the study. And in doing that, that'll set a foundation to get into the text itself. <clears throat> now, not only is it controversial and in some cases goes against the grain of not only the world, obviously, but it goes against the grain of a lot of Christians. So there's a lot of controversy within the church as well. In fact, I know a lot of pastors who avoid the early chapters because of the controversial issues in every one of the chapters. So uh, you'll get a flavor of that even in this introduction. And another thing I just want to say up front, just thank Robbie for the privilege to be here tonight and to fill the pulpit and if I go against any of his views it is totally inadvertent there are varieties of views on many different issues in the book and uh, I don't know everything that Robbie holds and uh, uh, we just all try to be biblical and that's all I'm going to try to do. So let's get started and get going on Genesis 1 and science. And by the way, uh, there's an outline. If you haven't picked one up, there's outlines up here. And for those that are live streaming, if you go to the home page, is that right? And click on the upper right hand, you can access the outline there. So, uh, Henry Morris says this is the most important book ever written. And I can see why. Uh, it is so foundational. It is so important. Francis Schaeffer used to say that if you take away the first three chapters of the book of Genesis, you really cannot maintain Christian doctrine. So this is not only a foundational book, but it is so important that it's very important that we have a clear view of it. It's the only place, really, that you can't find ultimate questions answered in philosophy. You can't find them answered in science, even though our culture elevated, ele elevates science to a very high position. But it's the book of Genesis that answers these ultimate questions. Where did we come from, for example? In other words, very personal, very intimate. Uh, what's my life all about? Where did I come from? Who am I? Who are we? Uh, the book introduces us, obviously, to mankind. And we have a foundation for all of anthropology in the book of Genesis. In fact, I contend that we have a foundation for all things. In fact, I teach a course with that title, Biblical Foundation for All Things. So who are we is answered. Uh, why are we here? In other words, is there any purpose behind us being here? And we will get into some of that, maybe not, well, not tonight for sure. <clears throat> 
But what I intend to do on Sunday is get a little bit further into the book of Genesis. And in fact, uh, I intend to, I don't know how to say this, uh, basically do the opposite of what uh, Robbie and I generally do. Generally, we go sentence by sentence. And <clears throat> when I'm teaching in the class that I teach in the church that I'm attending, sometimes it'll take... Well, I was in Romans 3, verse 21 through 26 for six weeks, one sentence. <laughs> so I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to try and go through the entire Bible. And I've titled it, uh, World History is Jewish, subtitled From Eternity to Eternity. So we're going to handle all of world history, which is will in, in fact involve all of the Bible as well. Now, obviously, you can't go verse by verse or sentence by sentence, but what I want to do is give a, a broad perspective on that. So we'll get started with Genesis tonight, and then we'll save that other topic for, for Sunday. So why are we here? What's the purpose? We'll look at that somewhat in Genesis 1. Also, as I've mentioned, it's a fundament, fund, foundation for all other issues as well. And particularly, the emphasis that I'm going to stress is we have the foundation for all of science, and that's going to be the stress that I'm going to try to bring forward here. So Genesis 1 and science, first of all, an introduction. And just so you know where I'm coming from, I think most of you probably already know, but I think it's good to be reminded because we need to constantly be reminded of what things are important and where we come from. So what are our basic assumptions? What are my assumptions? Number one, God exists. And you need to follow that with as revealed by the Bible. A lot of people will admit that God exists, but uh, a lot of people's image of who God is or their idea in their heads is one that is not necessarily biblical. So... I believe that God exists only as he is revealed in the Bible. In fact, I believe in the incomprehensibility of God, that mankind left to himself cannot, does not have the ability to come to an understanding of God, that we need more than just intellect, we need more than in fact, science doesn't give us a picture of who God is. Philosophy can't do it. The only place that we have a picture of the true God is from Revelation. So God is incomprehensible, not that he is not knowable. There's a difference between the knowability of God and the incomprehensibility of God. God is incomprehensible in that we cannot, on our own, come to an accurate understanding of who he is, but we can know something of God, and even the incomprehensibility of God means that uh, we will never exhaust who God is, even through all eternity, because we are finite. We would have to be omniscient to do that. So that's part of the incomprehensibility of God, but he's knowable. And I believe that that God exists as he is revealed in Scripture, he has spoken in his word, and he has revealed himself. He's revealed a plan. He's revealed uh, all that we need to know. And I believe the only source of that true knowledge is also his, his word, revelation, once again. So that's where I'm coming from. Thirdly, revelation, and this is very important. This is what I'm going to stress Revelation is more important than science theory, and I'm going to stress on that. The majority of the church has a very high view of science, not that I don't. In fact, my background is science, so I have a high view of science as well, <clears throat> but it fits within the proper perspective in terms of truth and knowledge, and I believe that revelation obviously is above uh, scientific theory. And the conflict that we have as believers is not with science per se, 
<clears throat> but the conflict that we have is with science theory, in other words, the ideas of men. Uh, so that's going to be stressed throughout as well. Fourthly, and I'm going to make another point that uh, nature today, and this goes contrary to common thinking in science, that's why I bring it out, but it's also an assumption, and I'm going to develop that assumption, nature today is different than what it was in the past. And what I mean by that is there is a pre-fall world that is radically different from the world in which we live in. Obviously, we know that we live in a fallen world. So conditions, and I think there are very important scientific implications of that as well. Scientifically, if we could analyze properties of materials, of uh, scientific data, if we could analyze, if we could go back and do that, we would find that even constants are different. So nature is different from what, what it is today. And I would contend that uh, the world is even different after the Genesis flood. We're living in a post-fall world and a post-flood world. And I think that is regulated. The, the, the science, science that we can understand today, I think, is regulated by the Noahic Covenant. In fact, I think that's what the covenant is all about. So I'm assuming that nature today is different than the past. That's radical. That's radical in science. That's radical in the church as well. But I think it's reality because that's what Revelation teaches us. So those are my assumptions. <clears throat> if we had a lot more time, we could spend a whole session on the attacks that are made on the book of Genesis, but I just want you to be aware of the three major areas where, we, where there's conflict. And there's conflict not only within uh, the world, but uh, even within uh, the church. In fact, our views on Genesis and even Revelation in general are far different from most in the broader body of Christ. In fact, our views tend to be minority views. So there are three major attacks on the book of Genesis that you need to be aware of. I think most of them historically began with an attack on the authorship in terms of Mo Moses as the author. So the issue of authorship immediately is controversial within the church. In fact, probably the beginning of liberalism came concerning the question of authorship. We'll touch a little bit on that later on because I want to give you a little uh, background as well as we get into the book of Genesis. The historicity of the book is also controversial. The majority, obviously, view within the church is that it's not historical. And even amongst evangelicals, uh, the book is questioned in terms of its historicity because of another related attack in the area of science. Because of some of the issues in science, some scholars, and as a result, the church, has backed away from looking at the early chapters, particularly uh, first 11 chapters, as uh, true history or historical. Now, I believe that they are entirely historical, and that's going to be one of the things that I'm going to bring out on the Sunday mornings that I'm here. So the historicity of the text, uh, there's lots of things that we could say just from Genesis 1. In fact, the first few verses argue very, very strongly for the historicity. In other words, this is historical narrative. The grammar is framed in such a way that it tells us that this, these are sequence, sequences of events. Uh, there's particular Hebrew grammar that's uh, involved in Genesis 1 that indicates that, and there's a lot of other things as well. So the historicity is attacked, and what we're going to focus in on is the scientific attack, and I'm going to try to focus in on that and give you a perspective that <clears throat> generally we don't hear in the church because most theologians are not trained in the sciences and uh, most of them back away. Uh, some of them don't understand it, so they're somewhat intimidated. Uh, not that I'm necessarily an expert, but 
I think there's some basic things that I think all of us can be aware of, and that's what I want to share with you, uh, the things that you can be aware of and the things that you can share as well. So it's not going to be technical per se, but I think there's some basic, basic truths that uh, if you understand them, uh, you can overcome the attacks from science, some, some very basic things. So we'll talk about those. So uh, thirdly, I'd like to kind of lay out three general approaches to the book of Genesis, and I've already hinted at these already. Liberals and even some uh, evangelicals simply capitulate. And I'm talking about, uh, I'm aware of a Bible church where the pastor wanted to teach, the people wanted him to teach Genesis, and he started Genesis in chapter, I think it was like 37, uh, the narrative of Joseph, because he didn't want to get into all of the controversy, and he was intimidated by that, and uh, unfortunately, that's where the Genesis exposition started. He did an excellent job, but uh, he left off the foundation. <laughs> But anyway, that, that's, I just use that as an example. Higher critics obviously reject Revelation in general and particularly Genesis, so they capitulate when it comes to the understanding of particularly the early chapters. The majority of the church attempts to accommodate the book of Genesis, particularly the early chapters, accommodate these chapters to science. Science is put at a level that uh, some believe cannot be questioned, some believe is, is settled, some believe uh, has enough credibility and valid, uh, validation to it, that uh, somehow the Bible has to fit within that because quest, uh, you can't question science. Well. There's a problem there, and we'll talk about that as well. In fact, the approach we're going to take is we're going to counterattack. <laughs> uh, we're going to use not only apologetics, but the, the text itself, and we're going to use science, because if you take true science, and I'm going to give you a biblical perspective on science. Uh, you didn't even know that there was one, did you? Or had you thought about it? Yeah, okay. There's a biblical view of science that is different than what is commonly practiced today. So I'm going to make some distinctions there and give you some simple things. This, this is not a complicated issue. I uh, hope I can make it simplified. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to give a counterattack. And I believe that Genesis itself, if we simply take the text at face value, in other words, interpret it proper, properly with proper hermeneutics, by itself, it gives us a counterattack. In fact, it gives us a different perspective on science. That's what I want to bring out. So we'll do that. And we'll view it somewhat as a polemic against all other worldviews other than the biblical worldview. The biblical worldview has science as part of it. In fact, a biblical worldview touches every area of thought, every area of life, and we need to approach every area, including science, from a biblical worldview, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a foundation for a biblical worldview for science. So that's kind of my goal and what I am intending to present beginning tonight. So those are the approaches. So let's take a look at some of that. And we start with hermeneutics. And I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with scripture hermeneutics or biblical hermeneutics. You see it by example every Sunday, every Tuesday, every Thursday, and probably every in-between time as well. So you're very familiar with that. I'm not going to spend too much time with it. But uh, what you're not probably familiar with is there's actually a science hermeneutic that we need to look at as well. But first of all, interpreting Scripture, uh, the, the fundamental goal, the fundamental 
uh, principle, you might say, of biblical or scriptural hermeneutics, I think is probably best stated by a hermeneutics text. The author's name is Mickelson. He says to find out, in other words, this is the goal. So you're familiar with this. This is what Robbie does every Sunday. Uh, to find out the meaning of a statement, in other words, a biblical statement, for the author. So first and foremost, our hermeneutic, our literal hermeneutic, or more technically grammatical, historical, contextual, that hermeneutic does everything that it can to discern what the original author attempted to communicate. Now, when we're talking about authorship of Scripture, we acknowledge that there are actually two authors. There's the human author, and then there's the divine author that inspires and reveals to that human author. <clears throat> so the goal is to discern what that human author is attempting to communicate. And because it's inspired, it is the same as the divine author. But also, in interpreting a text, we also take into account how did the original listeners or readers understand this biblical text. And if you apply, apply that simple test, you can eliminate 90% of the way Genesis 1 is interpreted today in the church, and particularly amongst uh, scientists. Because if you impose, for example, an evolutionary time scale, and the majority of the church does that, in other words, days don't mean days, they mean long ages, uh, well, did uh, the original readers look at the book of Genesis, and would they have understood this billion-year time scale? And the answer to that is no way. They might have understood maybe longer period of times, but not billions of years. And that's, that's a very common view of Genesis 1. So to find out the meaning of a statement for the author and the for the first hearers or readers. That's the goal of all of our conservative hermeneutic. And once you understand the text, in other words, how did those original readers understand the text, and what was that original author trying to communicate? Once you are able to capture that meaning, that understanding of the text, now we can do the other, thereupon to transmit that meaning to modern, modern readers. And that's what you hear from the pulpit Sunday after Sunday. In other words, how does it apply to us in the 20, 21st century? But you have to first understand the text, and then you can apply the text. And you separate the two. Uh, the majority of the church as well sometimes mixes those two. In other words, the meaning is how it applies, but that's deviating from a proper hermeneutic. So that's biblical hermeneutics and a quick summary of what you're exposed to day in and day out. What you're not exposed to is there's a hermeneutic in interpreting science and particularly science as it's related to the things that we're going to talk about in terms of uh, early chapters of Genesis. So let's take a look at that. We're going to in, uh, we interpret Scripture, and we're going to interpret creation. How do we interpret that? There's some basic things. What we need to understand, there's a distinction that we need to make in the sciences. And I'm going to lay this out here. First of all, there is what's called observational science. This is what scientists do day in, day out. In other words, you, you make observations, you apply the scientific method, you make as many scientific observations as you, you can on the phenomenon that you're studying, and, and then you come up with some way of correlating that, those observations, this is scientific method, and then you attempt to validate that hypothesis, and, uh, and then you come up with a test to, to validate it or to falsify it, and, and then uh, you have confidence that uh, your observations are on the right track. We have very little, as believers, we don't have a lot of conflict with observational science because it can be checked. 
Uh, experimentation helps us to validate if it in fact is validated. Uh, we don't have too many problems with that. Where we have the major problems is in the area of what's called, well, observational science. The basis is observations in present time that can be checked, all right? There's a difference between observational science and historical science. When we're dealing with issues of genesis, when we're dealing with origins, we're talking about historical science. This is a valid science as well, but you need to keep some things in mind in the practice of that. It's different, and a lot of people don't make that the distinction that we're going to make tonight. There's a distinction between observational science and historical science. Historical science deals, obviously, as the name indicates, with the study of things of the past. And things in the past are unique. They happen once. You can't go back. There's no such thing as a time machine. You can't recreate those events. But you can construct a model, or you can construct ideas concerning the past, and try to interpret them. In fact, we do that all the time. That's what history does. It's a reconstructing of explanation of past events. But another good example of the practice of historical science is all of archaeology. Archaeology deals in the realm of historical science. In other words, it's looking and trying to uncover artifacts to reconstruct a culture, for example. And if you have adequate artifacts and your best artifact are writ written documents that uh, give explanation, and if you have adequate data, then you have a higher degree of confidence that you've reconstructed that past. That's what we're doing when we're talking about origins, when we're talking about creation, when we're doing, talking about the Genesis flood, when we're talking about the Tower of Babel, when we're dealing with issues in the past, that's the area of historical science. So you need to make that distinction and make it clear in those that you are ministering to and speaking with concerning these, these issues. So observational science deals with present observations, but because you can't reconstruct the past, all you can look at scientifically are the traces left by past events. How do you know, for example, that uh, Abraham Lincoln lived? Does anyone, has anyone met him? Does anyone know him personally? Well, not today. But we have a high degree of confidence that he lived because there are traces of his life that are left behind. The best traces are written documents, eyewitness accounts. Well, are there any eyewitness accounts dealing with origins? Well. Only one. <laughs> but there are no human eyewitnesses, but there are traces that can be studied. And things like Genesis Flood, you can study that as well. There's traces of the past. Uh, so that's what historical science tries to do. And, and by the way, not only archaeology, but uh, what's real popular today are these, what are they called, CSI programs on TV where they reconstruct crime scenes. Well, the whole criminal justice system deals in this area of historical science. In other words, recreating a crime scene. In other words, picking up all the data, the traces of that past event, blood spatters, uh, shells of uh, rounds of shots and that sort of thing, try to reconstruct what happened at that scene, and eventually try to figure out who caused the crime. It's, it's a reconstructing of the past. That's historical science. So it's a valid science. We are trying to do the same thing when it comes to issues of origin. So you need to make that distinction. So let's kind of refine that. So when we're talking about data that's relating to the past, data in observational science are those observations that you make, okay? Data, when it comes to historical science, are the traces left by the events, whatever they may be. Rock layers, fossils, whatever, all right? 
Um, if you can find written documents, that's even better, but if you, if you can't, then you work with what you've got. The next part is very, very important. A historical fact, and this is true of history as well, and any data in historical science, a historical fact is that data, in other words, those traces of left by that event, and very important, I put it in red to call attention to it, I should have put it in bigger font as well, and underlined it and starred it and everything else. Notice interpretation. So everything that you deal with that deals with the past involves interpretation. Don't miss that. That's extremely important. The problem and the conflict that we have as believers is not necessarily with the data. Our problem is with interpreting the data. And the data can oftentimes be interpreted in different ways. And that's where we have the problem. So you have to investigate what are the assumptions that are made in guiding those interpretations. We start with radically different assumptions than the secular scientist or even the Christian that is a scientist that studies in these areas that uh, adopts humanistic ideas or humanistic assumptions. That's why I underlined at the very <clears throat> beginning the assumption that I make that the present today, conditions today, are different than they were in the ancient past before the Genesis flood. That's a huge assumption. Assumption. We'll, we'll talk some more about that. So keep in mind this distinction. This is historical science. It includes the data that you can observe. The archaeologist comes up with artifacts. That's the data. If he has an inscription or some written document or something, that's the data. But now he has to interpret that data and come to some conclusions about that culture that he's trying to reconstruct. So also, similarly, when we deal with things like origins. So interpreting creation. So we're talking about hermeneutics here or interpreting the natural realm. You could say interpreting nature, but I prefer to use interpreting creation because I do have a bias, <laughs> because I have some assumptions, because I believe that the Bible is inerrant, and I believe that it's inspired, and I believe it gives us valid data. We'll talk some more about that in a moment. I'm going to give you first how secular science basically attempts to reconstruct the past. And in some cases, they may not be too far off, in more recent events, because you have more, more data, but when it comes to ancient events, you have less, less uh, real data to work with, so you can have a divergence of interpretation. What is practiced today by science, and if we had more time, I could lay out kind of the, the historical development of uh, modern science, I guess you could say, the, actually, the origin of modern science came from Bible-believing people that were motivated from Scripture to study the creation, like Isaac Newton, for example, people in that era. In his day, he was better known for his Bible teaching than his science. His science was more of a hobby. He was committed to the scriptures, he believed in the inerrancy, he came from a biblical worldview, but today science has departed from that biblical worldview and practices what can be described as methodological naturalism. In other words, this is the religion of science today, and particularly historical science. Methodological naturalism. In other words, naturalism is the guiding principle. 
in interpreting ancient events or even any past events. And what happens is uh, naturalistic theory is imposed on the data, imposed in such a way that that guides the interpretation. And as a result of that, God is left out, Scripture is left out, so a whole range of data is left out, so you end up with an inadequate interpretation of the data, particularly the more ancient the events that you are studying. So methodological naturalism imposes naturalistic theory. Now this is practice today. In fact, in science today, only a naturalistic explanation is permitted. In other words, if you cannot explain phenomenon based on natural law, then it is omitted, it is excluded. So it has to fit within naturalism. That's methodological naturalism. Secondly, well, here's some of the flaws, and then I'll get to the second point there. Some of the flaws of naturalism or naturalistic interpretation is what is called uniformitarianism. It's a big word, but it's got a pretty easy understanding. It basically has the idea is the laws of science that you can observe today have always existed. Uh, a key way of describing it, they will use the phrase, the present is the key to the past. So it denies that there have been changes over time in the natural realm. In other words, constants are constants. Natural law is natural law. It has always been there. It always will be there. In fact, they are, they are viewed almost as eternal. That's uniformitarianism. But uniformitarianism this is a, the fundamental assumption of science today, particularly uh, historical science. Present is the key to the past. But it is not scientifically verified because you can't go back and see and check. Can't go back in the past to see if conditions were the same. Even after the flood, you can't do that. I mean, you can't reconstruct the past. So you can't verify it scientifically. It's an assumption. Remember that. It's an assumption that you utilize or the science community utilizes. Thirdly, it goes against Scripture because Scripture clearly tells us that things have been different in different time frames. There's a pre-fall world. There's a pre-flood world. And if you believe in a resurrection, there's going to be a future world that's different from the world we're living in now. So the laws of nature are not constant. Constants are not necessarily constant. Uniformitarianism says they are. But it's an assumption. can't be verified. In fact, it cannot be proven because you can't go into the past. And it goes against Scripture because Scripture teaches the very opposite. So uniformitarianism is the fatal flaw to methodological naturalism. Secondly, evolutionism is also assumed, even though it's unproven and it's a false idea. But it's assumed in most uh, even observational science, but particularly it's assumed in historical science. Humanism is also assumed. In other words, man's ability to understand the natural realm. In other words, man is perfectly capable to study and apply principles of science and come to valid conclusions. And in general, that sometimes is the case, but uh, not always the case. And it's Glaringly not the case when we deal with ancient events. Fourthly, it excludes revelation. In other words, that is excluded in terms of data. It excludes it. You can't come up with a supernatural explanation or an explanation that you could derive from revelation, from the scriptures is what we would say. So these are the flaws. And 
science practiced today using methodological naturalism has an anti-supernatural bias. So those are the flaws. You need to keep these in mind because this is how science is de dealt with and why there's such a divergence in views, particularly the further back in time you go. So, methodological naturalism imposes naturalistic theory with all of those flaws. And secondly, if, they're, if you're a believer and are assuming those assumptions and using this methodological... Uh, metho uh, uh, I'm an engineer, I can't talk sometimes. <laughs> uh, method methodology. Uh, if you're a believer and... You believe that the Bible, even if you believe it's the Word of God, and even if you believe it's inspired, but if you're coming from a secular worldview in the sciences, then the natural tendency is to attempt to harmonize Genesis with modern theory. But modern theory is theory because you can't go back and reconstruct the creation events. See what I'm saying here? So, the attempt is to harmonize, okay, well, how do we make Genesis fit? And I'll tell you up front, Genesis doesn't fit. Don't try to make it fit. All right, I like this guy up here. Come up, sit up here better. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> what generally happens, and I'm talking about the majority of the church, and I'm talking about a lot of evangelical church. I'm talking about Bible churches. They tend to accommodate the text. And I read a commentary. Well, I'll give the name. Hugh Ross, who claims to be a believer. <laughs> You're familiar with him. Um, I have no reason to question his claim or uh, his view uh, I would assume that he is. Uh, he does ministry, or at least he calls it ministry. Uh, he has a commentary on the book of Genesis. He accommodates the text. And as I studied through his commentary, I noticed four things, and it dawned on me once I realized those four things, just about every other commentary that accommodates the text has these four elements as well. The first thing that he does is he emphasizes in the text the details of the text that support his presuppositions concerning origins. One of his presuppositions is long periods of time, in other words, millions of years that cre the creation event took place. In other words, the earth is millions of years old. It's, a, it's an old universe. So he emphasizes the supporting details that support that idea. So that's one thing I noticed. And, you know, he'll make some points and in some cases define terms, do almost the same thing that we would do in exegeting the text, but only with the details that support his view. Then he superimposes current theory, and particularly his theories, which go along with... Um, a lot of others from this perspective. Uh, thirdly, now he reinterprets the text. In other words, he accommodates the text, makes the text fit the theory. Because science dictates, science is the authority. In fact, he even thinks that uh, science is almost inspired in his viewpoint. So from that perspective, science helps us to understand the text, but helps us in reinterpreting the text. Then the fourth thing I noticed is he ignores the non-supporting details. And some of those non-supporting details are glaring. In other words, they're very obvious and very clear to see. So uh, that's what happens when you try to accommodate the text. And the most important thing is the reinterpreting of the biblical text. So that's science hermeneutics. Now let me give you a picture one step uh, into the sciences. Uh, there's 
what we could describe secular science today, for example, viewing the laws of nature, or we would call that creation, they're unchanging. In other words, they're eternal. They've always been the way they are today, and today is the key to the past, so they've always been that way in the past. And the same could be say it said for constants, and they would consider this to be truth. In other words, this is reality, this is truth, but it's an assumption because you can't go into the past, right? We've already established that. And they view us and God and religion, in other words, the areas of spirituality and church and the Bible, that's man's opinion. Okay, that's a secular viewpoint. And unfortunately, sometimes that creeps into the church as well. Well, there's a different approach, so let's take a, a biblical worldview approach and apply the biblical worldview to science particularly. And we can come to some conclusions from Scripture concerning the natural realm, and I've got a few of the major things outlined on the next slide here. And we could say that Scripture says and is clear that only God is eternal. Only God is eternal. Uh, on the right-hand side is the natural realm. So the natural realm has a created beginning, and as I've already indicated, there have been transformative events that have changed laws of nature. So constants and laws of nature are not eternal in a biblical worldview. They're subject to change. Uh, depending on the will of the Creator, okay? So only God is eternal. There's nothing in the created realm that is eternal. Nothing. Only God is eternal. Secondly, only God is infinite. Now, there's some scientists that think that the universe, is, they, they can't observe the limits. So some assume that it has no limits, uh, but the universe, we would understand biblically, is limited in all ways. Limited because it's finite, it's a creation, it's only what God put in place. Only God is infinite, not the creation. Thirdly, only God is truth. Truth is personal. God embodies truth. God is true. John, what is it? 3.33, I think. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. That's absolute truth. Only God is absolute truth and what he reveals. Okay? The creation, this is the biblical view of creation, can reflect truth. In fact, God has built things in the creation such that he reveals something of himself so that none are with excuse, Romans 1. And God has done that since the creation. So the creation is built with information that every human being that has ever lived and will live has had a revelation of God. So it's a reflection of that truth. It's a reflection of God. But only God is truth. Only God is self-existent. Some scientists think that the universe is self-existent. Well, it's large and we can't see beyond it, but the universe is not self-existent. It is dependent. In fact, everything is dependent and upheld. Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, all things are upheld by God himself, Jesus Christ. So the universe is dependent, and there's not a, a, an electron in the universe that's not dependent on God sustaining it and keeping it in its orbit. So it's self, or, or dependent, only God is self-existent. So we come to these conclusions from Revelation. So if you exclude Revelation, then scientifically you're at a great disadvantage. Only God is immutable, unchanging. I've already kind of 
given a way that I believe the laws of nature can change. In fact, miracles by their very definition are tweaks in nature where God intervenes and does things that are beyond nature. Not violations, but additions. In other words, God doesn't violate his laws, if you want to call them that, the laws he's built into the creation, but he adds to them, okay? Uh, they're not immutable, only God is immutable, so constants are temporary as God desires, and they're going to be radically changed when we live in a world with resurrected people in a millennial kingdom. So there's some profound uh, implications of a different view of science. Only God is sovereign, and all of the creation is a servant to the Creator. And He's created it for certain purposes, and He has a certain plan for it, and He uses it to His own ends and His own desires, and He's going to bring it to a conclusion. Uh, Sunday, I'm going to try and give you that broad plan. So that's the beginning of a biblical worldview on science. So we could say science, we have a creator that is sovereign and he's Lord, sovereign Lord. You might say that's redundant. Yeah, well, I like it. But. And we have constants and laws that are temporarily constant, and we have a dependent creation subject to the will and desires of that creator. This is a biblical view of science. Make sense? Applying these things, now we can interpret the creation, avoiding methodological naturalism that imposes naturalistic theory and tries to reinterpret the biblical text. Instead, we apply a biblical worldview. We begin with scripture in issues of science. There are two world-class scientists that are from the city I come from, and the reason they're there is both of them have retired, one of them from Sandia National Labs. Uh, you probably heard of Russ Humphreys. The other one, John Baumgartner, is a geophysicist who retired from Los Alamos National Laboratories. We are privileged to have two national laboratories, so we have a lot of high-class scientists there. These are two world-class scientists. Both of them, before they do any research, they will search the scriptures to see what the scripture says in the area that they are studying to see if there's some indications or guidelines or a framework to frame their research. They start with scripture, and particularly Genesis because there's lots in there that guides all of the, uh, the sciences. I'm going to try and demonstrate that as well. They, un they avoid the unbelieving worldview and try to maintain a biblical worldview in their scientific endeavor. And then they have a better position to be able to interpret the physical data because they have more data than the secular scientist. They have the advantage of revelation, okay? And we have the biblical support. What does God tell Job 38.4? You don't have answers to all these issues, particular issues of the past. Were you, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you there? Were you an eyewitness? Nope, there's nobody there. We only have one eyewitness, Job 38.4. Okay, so when it comes to interpreting the data, how you approach the data makes a whole world of difference. If you come with presuppositions A, if you come with a secular worldview, if you come to the data with an evolutionary perspective, and you view the data, whether it be rock layers or fossils, paleontology or whatever, or biology or physics, it doesn't matter just uh, kind of a little box there that has the data. That presupposition, those assumptions that you start with are going to influence the way you see the data 
And you're going to end up with an interpretation that is in line with your presuppositions. I mean, that's just what's going to happen. That's just what happens. You can observe it day in and day out. If you begin with presuppositions B, we look at the same data. We don't change the data. Same data. But we also look at revelation. That's part of our data because it sets the framework. It sets the parameters to do good science. And given that revelation, we see the data differently. We see it as part of God's creation that God has built into it. And particularly when we're looking at ancient events, we see that there have been differences after the flood than before the flood. So we can use that data to come to a different interpretation, B. All right? So that's the essence of the differences that we have in interpreting the early chapters of Genesis, whether it be the creation account or whether it be issues of the fall. I believe the fall is a historical event. We're going to talk about that one Sunday. Or the Genesis flood, how we view that. Current geology says there is no evidence for a Genesis flood. Absolutely none. So what does the church do? Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to disturb you. Uh, maybe the flood was local. Yeah, that's it. The flood had to be just in Mesopotamia. Well, if we had time, I could I, I have a three-hour talk on the overwhelming scientific evidence of a Genesis flood. The evidence is overwhelming. In fact, it's so overwhelming that the scientist misses the forest for the trees. Okay? So it's a difference of viewing the data and interpreting the data. Remember, interpretation is part of the practice of historical, um, historical science. So the issue is one of authority. In terms of those within the church, and I'll use the old earth view as an example, old earth creationists, science is their final authority. And they put it over scripture. Scripture is twisted or reinterpreted to fit man's ideas and generally evolutionary ideas. The young earth view, the alternative, the young earth view, Scripture is the final authority. And once Scripture is the final authority, now we let the Scripture speak for itself. And if it speaks to issues of science, it's going to give us the parameters of science. So our science has to fit, and I'm going to say Genesis 1. In other words, Genesis 1 sets the parameters for science. And it fits it far better than uh, current theories in terms of uh, early origins and that sort of thing. So that's the issue of authority. That's probably a good place to stop for tonight. And we'll start on an exposition of Genesis 1 next, what is it, Tuesday? And... To conclude, let me go to a concluding slide here. And then we'll close in a word of prayer. So just to kind of wrap things up, we acknowledge God as creator, and that means that we are all accountable. This is the bottom line. The unbeliever, and particularly even the scientist, the bottom line, the reason he doesn't want to allow Scripture to speak is because if God is creator, that means we are accountable to him. We as believers acknowledge that and we praise him as creator. So we can praise him tonight that everything that we observe out there, all of the sciences basically come from him. We have a foundation for all of the sciences in at least Genesis 1. And we'll look further into that next week. Let's close it with a word of prayer.
Father, we praise you and we take comfort that you as creator, you have a plan. You as creator had us in view in your creation. You also knew that we would sin and you made a provision for that, so we praise you. And we know because you are creator and also the one that has brought salvation that we praise you as creator and savior. We want to praise you and continually be reminded of these things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.